I sometimes try to understand science, and trying to understand science means trying to write the history of science. And uh, now I was asked um, to say something about the statue of science in these days, and so I decided, I called my lecture Save Science from Drowning, and, uh, but it has to have a nicer title, so it's called Coming Up for Air, and I will explain to you this title in a moment. I guess I, I, I really think that science is in a difficult situation, like the euro or something like this. Uh, uh, but there's no Frank uh, being uh, loosened. And I will give you a few, before I start my talk, I will give you a few examples what I think is complicated with science. This is Berlin, and uh, in Berlin, 100 years ago, a fellow named Albert Einstein uh, put forward his general theory of relativity. So we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the theory of relativity. And I'm saying this only because I'm convinced that none of you understands a word of it. And I'm convinced that none of the people that write about it, except the experts, understand a, a word of it. So here we have a problem. We have the greatest theory on Earth, and you don't understand it. You don't even have the slightest idea what it is about. And this is uh, called trouble of science. It's a trouble in science. You don't understand it. I mean, uh, Einstein has written about it, uh, lots of books, but nobody, and they are coming up in 20th edition, but nobody reads it. Actually, I've never met somebody that has written, read a book about Einstein. I mean, I've never have met a people that has re read one of my books, but that's not so, <laughs> it's not so important. But Einstein has published this, and Einstein has tried to describe it, but I haven't found anybody that understands it. And recently, the, the television uh, studio called up and said, they have to do something about the relativity theory. I said, yeah, do you understand the relativity theory? And they said, no. I said, yeah, but do you, why do you do something about it? Why don't you describe to the audience that you don't understand it? That might be the first uh, the, the starting point. The second problem with science you can easily um, uh, understand this. When this century started, the year 2000, the German uh, organizations of science, they decided to do something about the uh, misunderstanding, public misunderstanding of science. And they founded an initiative called Public Understanding of Science. By the way, it was founded in Germany in English. Uh, because if you and try to translate public understanding of science from English into German, you have two ways of uh, translating it. You can talk about really understanding science or being, uh, being ready to pay money for science. There's also a type of understanding. So what they wanted is have money for science, but they didn't care really about understanding. And this year they gave up. There is no more initiative public understanding of science, so <laughs> there is no public understanding of science. <laughs> Here we go. This is the most effective tool we have. Our life depends on it, and we don't understand it. I mean, of course, uh, there's a lot of things we don't understand either. I mean, my life depends on my heart, and I don't understand it, but that's uh, another problem. Uh, my, my, sometimes when I drive, my life depends on the brakes, and I don't understand them, but it's OK. But in a sense, I have the feeling that we should understand at least a bit more about science, and maybe a little bit more about the general theory of relativity, was because that is the greatest theory on Earth. And there are billions and billions of dollars spent in order to test it. And all this, what we know about the cosmos, is only due to Einstein's theory. So you might want to take a look. Um, if you really want to take a look, I can recommend one of my books. But <laughs> <laughs> and the third topic I would like to start with before I uh, go into my talk is that there is a movement now in Germany that's called citizen science. The idea is that the scientists are experts and specialists and they have certain interests so it might not be, they might not do the right things. They investigate Higgs particles that nobody understands, although they cost a billion euros, though a billion euros is much less this week than last week. <clears throat> and and so they want to do something more important. They want to do something for sustainability and stuff like this. So they have decided we should finance citizen science. And the basic idea behind this movement, it's not really strong, but it's coming up. And next week, uh, I'm supposed to sit on a podium discussing this with some sociologists. Mm. The real the idea behind this is that science should be more democratic, so democratize science. But a good friend told me recently that there are limits to democracy. 
And one of the limits was described by our Chancellor Willy Brandt. He said, there are limits to democracy. You cannot, in a family, take ballot who is the father. I mean, there's no way to, to vote about this. It's very clear who is the father. And you cannot vote what is the truth. So there's something. And of course, if you, and if you assume there's a citizen science coming up, then they, the first thing they do is they set up an ethics committee. An ethics committee decides if something is reasonable or it's not reasonable. I tell you what, if evolution had listened to an ethics committee, <laughs> we would never have invented upright walking. <laughs> because you can fall down, <laughs> especially when you're old and when you're a child. And of course, it's, uh, it's unfair to the other animals that run on four flea. And, you should not, and of course, you, you dare to go up to the, him, the sky. So you haven't. And you never, so the ethics committee would have prevented upright walking. Citizen science will uh, make sure that uh, we count birds and uh, other stuff like this. But so we have a problem. I, I think we have a problem. But of course, now eventually I have to start with my talk. <laughs> <clears throat> I, it's called Coming Up for Air, and in case you don't know, that's the title of a novel written by a fellow named George Orwell. I'm sure you all know George Orwell's 1984, a book that was written in 1948, and it's complicated to say this in German because then you have to <laughs> turn the numbers around. And uh, George Orwell has also written a famous other book, it's called Animal Farm, with this famous sentence, all animals are equal, but some are more equal. <laughs> All professors are equal, but some are more equal. <clears throat> this is the same. But he has written also this nice book, Coming Up for Air. And he has written it in 1939. And uh, it's published, in, it's a pessimistic novel. I mean, in case you are, want to read a novel, uh, I would not recommend this one in particular, but 1984 is much better. So pessimistic novel, assuming that speculation, com commercial, <laughs> you have to help me. Commercialization and capitalism are killing the best of rural England, which, but of course, uh, the year is uh, for us important. In 1939, it's obviously that World War II is threatening. Actually, it's close to begin. And Euro and science will again play a crucial role in it. The atomic bomb will follow the use of the poisonous gas in World War II. And the beginning of 1939, it's especially interesting because Albert Einstein wrote this letter to President Roosevelt in order to start uh, the Manhattan Project. And, uh, but remember uh, how fast uh, things were moving at this time. The basic idea, I mean, the, 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 uh, the atomic bomb works was nuclear fission. And nuclear fission was discovered only in December 1938. And it was discovered here in Berlin. And it was discovered by a chemist named Otto Hahn who didn't understand what it had discovered. So he sent a letter to his fellow worker, Lisa Meitner, who had to emigrate to Sweden. And Lisa Meitner became this letter in 1938, shortly before Christmas time. And here I would like you to stop for a moment and wonder about a person in a certain situation to understand which impact science can have. Lisa Meitner, 60 years old, in a country whose language she didn't speak, get a letter from Otto Hahn describing her the experiments then he puts when he hits uranium with neutrons, then barium is obviously produced. That sounds like a very innocent sentence. What can be more bar boring than saying that take neutrons, put it on uranium, and you get barium? So, so say, who cares? Well, she did because she immediately realized that what Otto Hahn observed was nuclear fission. She didn't call it that way, but she realized how much energy is freed from this. And she knew also that when you do this, then two more neutrons are liberated, and these two neutrons can continue the fission of other uh, uranium atoms. So the chain reaction is going on. And she immediately knew that you can build atomic bombs. Imagine, you are a 60-year-old little woman, in a, shortly before Christmas, the snow is falling, it's quiet, it's solemn, and you know you can destroy the world. This is science. This is actually what science is all about. Each scientist 
knows that he can do much more than Napoleon ever did. He can do much more than any army ever achieved. He can do this by just sitting there and thinking. But nobody understands this power of science except you, of course. Okay, now we have to continue. I have to, I have to continue with my lecture. <laughs> keep on driving away. <clears throat> so anyhow, so we have this situation in 1939. <clears throat> and the, in this year and following years, the historians have uh, used, uh, started to talk about what they call the fall from grace, the Sündenfall, the fall of man that science experienced in the 20th century, it's lost its innocence. I mean, it produced poisonous gas, it produced atomic weapons. When, and when, whenever you read a short overlook of science in the 20th century, they talk about this. They hardly mention, uh, to my knowledge, they hardly mention, the overwhelming trust in science in the 1960s, when everybody was definitely believing optimistically in the progress that science could be made. I will talk about this. And this followed an immediately post-war surge in Western civilizations. That is called the 1950s syndrome. I think the 1950s syndrome is the most important uh, historical development that we have experienced after the Second World War and that we have to understand what really happened then and what we made wrong when this happened or what we made right when this happened. So there was in the 60s an overwhelming trust and belief in science, but today things look a little bleak again and I would like to tell you why. It has to do with the uh, European community. We had in this year an election for the European Parliament and there was a group of scientists, the Alliance of European Ac Ac Academies. They sat down and uh, they uh, uh, forward, put forward a letter. I was part of writing this letter. We wanted to address the importance of science and tell <clears throat> the people in the parliament that they should accept this and uh, uh, know more about this. So there was the idea, it was called Wissenschaft als Grundlage der kulturellen Entwicklung, science as a basis of cultural development. And we wanted them to accept the resolution that we were composing, expressing the historical and actual importance of science for the existence of men and the future of our planet. This is one of the sentences. The newly elected European Parliament recognizes the special role that science has played in our history and will occupy in the future. It will help to keep the quality of science at a high level and support its efforts by improving science education and its institutional embodiment and representation. In case uh, uh, you need some explanations of this sentence. Um, the, the, the special role that science has played in our history can be uh, located at the beginning of the 17th century when that occurred what, we, what historians in the meantime call the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution was the idea discovered by scientists that by doing science, the future can be better than the past. You don't have to, you don't have to, and the, the idea is that history is not something that happens to you, but history is something that, scienti that scientific thinking can produce. So you become the real actor in the history, historical development of human beings, and this is invented by scientists. It's, there are a lot of writings about and the basic idea is that the future can be better. In other words, science is for the betterment of human beings, and this is actually what Alfred Nobel uh, eventually thought also in the late 19th century when he invented the Nobel Prize. It has to be for the betterment of human beings. By the way, in case you don't know, um, when Alfred Nobel set up his prize, he first wanted to do it for peace and literature. And then somebody said, well, who's going to get the prize for peace? And somebody said, well, Frau von Sundner, Bertha von Sundner will get it. So Nobel, he went, was in love with Bertha von Sundner. He asked her, what do you think about this, setting a prize for peace? And Bertha von Sundner came up with the most brilliant idea that's not due to Nobel, but due to a woman. She said, Alfred, I mean, oh, oh Dr. Nobel. <laughs> Alfred, if you really want peace, you must make sure that people can lead a better life. And if you want that people lead a better life, you have to support science. You have to give prizes for science. So the Nobel Prize is because a woman said, if you want peace, you have to improve the life of human beings. That's the basic idea. 
It's, is that so difficult? I don't know. Again, so, and the other thing is, just a little side note, uh, improving science education and its institute, institutional embodiment. That sounds so easy. But please note that the European development in science is not only due to some geniuses, some great people that were doing good experiments, but due to an institution. This institution is called university. You might hate university. You might think it's going down the drain. You might think it's a lot of things going wrong. But the university has made Europe strong. And you know, university is an invention of the Occident. And there is uh, another region of the world that's called Orient, in order to avoid the other names for that. <laughs> and this Orient doesn't have universities, except a few that they copied. So they don't have any embodiment of science, so there is no science. You know, while we in Western countries invest several percent of the gross national product, the GNP, in science, the Orient less than 0.1%. That's the difference. But of course, this is a political topic. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Anyhow, so this letter continues, and we make 10 suggestions to, this, uh, to the European Parliament. We put more money for science, more support for better universities, better school books, improved structures for science, new combinations. I was told about some new about <laughs> cardiology. In when Intervention, okay, great, great idea. A historian science center, a European science center, higher standards for, for uh, tests, a European holiday for science. I like this idea best. <laughs> <laughs> and a whole day in parliament for debating science. Can you imagine? A whole day only devoted to science? That might be great, because then nobody will be there. They have nothing to say. So today it's a science day in the parliament. I guess maybe the chancellor is coming. <clears throat> You know, this is the idea, and we were all proud that we finished this letter and we thought, oh, we have the new election, we have a new commissioner, and he will immediately do this. Because it seems things look good first, because the last uh, chief commissioner, or what is it, uh, had uh, n named a chief scientific advisor. Her name is Anne Glover, and here's her homepage. Welcome to my website. It's an enormous pleasure for me to be the first scientific advisor to the President of the European Commission and to be in the position to talk about the excellence in science, engineering, technology. I'm looking forward with as many people as possible to deliver our common goal to the for European Union. We can remind ourselves that Europe, through science, engineering, technology, invented the modern world and this is what her job was supposed to be. And you know all what happened. <clears throat> she was asked. The, only, the first thing Juncker did, he asked the chief scientific advisor. And probably you haven't even noticed. Because in German newspapers, it was just uh, on the seventh page, a uh, little note. Lost. Nobody has protested against it. Nobody has cried. And uh, the amazing thing is, he did it on purpose at a certain day when you were all looking at what Rosetta was doing on this comet. While European scientists were watching Rosetta, President Juncker scrapped the role of his top scientific advisor. This is politics, and we are all were fooled, and nobody has protested against this. I hate this idea. So we have to have, we have a new problem. We have to really coming up for air. We have to do something about science in this situation. We don't have a chief scientific advisor anymore. We, don't, we have a German government that is not really interested in science. Even our chancellor is not. And so and they, they do this on the side, but they don't debate science. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bad so, but so what do we have to do? OK, before I continue this, um, I was, I'm only a replacement for a fellow named Axel Meyer. <laughs> who was, to, was supposed to talk about the evolution of gill and lung or something. So you probably are expecting that I talk also about evolution of fish. I promise you I do it. <clears throat> because at the same time when George Orwell was writing his novel Coming Up for Air, there was somebody coming up for air. There was a strange discovery. All of a sudden this fish was discovered. It has a strange name of silukans. Uh, uh, and, uh, it was, and it has fins like 
limbs, and it was obviously a fish. That, after closer looking, they realized that this fish was supposed to be dead 80 million years ago. But obviously, two or three uh, copies survived. And you see on the right-hand side uh, the way we expect him to coming up for air, uh, leave water, go to land, and eventually uh, produce us. So. <laughs> <laughs> You just have to introduce upright walking, but if you don't have the ethics committee I talked about, that will, will work out. Uh, so it, it, this is called uh, the uh, Silakant. It's a Quastenflosser, was, uh, has changed 60 million years, and it's obviously the uh, connecting uh, uh, part of between water life and uh, land life. They discovered one. Uh, on the Comoren, uh, the left side of this picture, or let's see, you can do this here. One, okay, if I can handle this. Uh, one was here. And then later on, they discovered another one in Indonesia. That is this one. And uh, so you see about the size, and it's an amazing, and from this, people try to understand the evolution of lungs and gills and legs and limbs and stuff like this. And here, you can see it in detail which I'm not going to... So you start with a ray fin fish. You get the silacant. That's C-O-E-L-A-C-A-N-T. You have to pronounce it silacant. Is that right? Silacant. Yeah. You didn't know? <laughs> so how do I know? Anyway, eventually you have Darwin or Professor Berger. Whatever you... Or me. Whatever you prefer. So I'm not going to... So the point is only that there is obviously some inner fish in us that is want to get out, wants to get out. So when we and when the, and if we would if you look really close to the evolution of man, we are depend we are um, stemming from animals that we would describe as fish. So we are uh, heritages of fish. We have an inner fish. We have uh, three point five billion fish history in our body, and we are bringing this story, this history, within us now finally to the outside. That's what we're always doing. And here is how we do it. <laughs> so we come out of the water. We eventually went upright walking. And then we go back to the water. If I would be um, uh, evil, I would say this is what is called religion. I mean, we are bound to the water. So we come out of the water and go back to the water. So here we go. This is our development. That we have to work on luck. It. And now we have to really, um, we obviously are ruining the oceans, we are ruining the climate, we are, and here you see what happens when the climate is changing, the oceans are uh, rising in their levels, the water is flowing to the cities, and we have to run away like this fellow here, uh, this time in London. So how do we come up for air? Well, we have to first understand the way we got there where we are now, where we're changing the climate, where we put too much garbage into the oceans. And this is, I think, only can only be understood if you look at the 1950s syndrome. The 1950s syndrome is when the world experienced a transition from a slow-growing society to a fast-moving society. And in the, as a consequence, we have a rapid loss of what is now today called global sustainability. The term sustainability was... Uh, not invented before the 1980s. And sustainability means that uh, uh, to, to act in a sustainable way means that you should act in such a way that your children or grandchildren can have the same opportunities and same possibilities that you have. So, but how, how do you do this? Anyhow, in the 1950s, obviously within no time that energy became cheap, the mobility of the masses uh, grew dramatically and seemingly, there was an unlimited economic growth. If some of you are my age, <laughs> and they have lived in Germany at this time, they remember that the most successful political slogan of a party, of the Christian Democratic Union, was by Konrad Adenauer, our first chancellor, and the slogan was, Keine Experimente. But of course, what he meant, or what we did, was the exact opposite we made the biggest experiment ever. Namely, we tried to see if permanent growth is possible. And if we can continue uh, economy with permanent growth and actually increasing growth. Not only growth, but 
growth and growth, the growth of growth, so the exponential growth. So we started the greatest experiments of all. We ruined, uh, we did not take care of any environment. There was no idea about this. And so we wanted just to have increase our, uh, to, 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 incre to, to increase the betterment, uh, to, to, to better our life uh, without looking left or right. There are a few uh, data that can show this. Uh, here you see the world energy consumption. And if you look at the uh, abscissa, you see the real uh, set uh, takeoff is in the 1950s. Now, in 1900, 1920, 1940s, it's, uh, it's OK. But then all of a sudden, uh, it goes, uh, especially the oil, the natural gas, and, uh, so the, and the coal. It's just amazingly uh, supplying energy, and we are making use of it as uh, far as possible. And we are used to that. We are, I mean, at least my generation is used uh, to live in a where energy is uh, no problem. Just you pay for it. Or it's, it's actually even cheap. It's, uh, it hardly costs anything. And in the 1960s, people were not worrying about anything what is called environment. They were just worrying how fast they could go to the future. In the 1960s, it was fashionable to predict the future. Uh, there was a fellow named Herman Kahn that founded the Hudson Institute uh, that invented the science called futurology and they predicted everything. Thinking about the unthinkable in the 1980s, the next 200 years. Uh, the nice thing about these books from the 60s is that you can still read them. <laughs> and it's amazing how stupid they are. But they were believed at this time. There is one book, I'm not giving away the title because the author is still alive and he's very proud of this book, but uh, he must have uh, probably he learns of it. The book starts with a sentence in 1968 saying that the time has gone where we will have religious wars. <laughs> we will never be, so we, all we have to do is growth, all we have to do is uh, betterment, we, and they, they start all kinds of, they have all kinds of ideas in these books. For instance, they want to use atomic power for constructing tunnels across the Alps. They want to put some stuff in the water in order to make sure <laughs> that our teeth uh, is working fine. They want to um, uh, give you some genes uh, for, to have better resistance for uh, and so on. And you have to read the book, it's unbelievable. And, but the people were op uh, optimistic and uh, science was actually so some on the top. Science was producing all kinds of promises and uh, science could even take a look on the Earth, so this is for the 1968 picture from the Apollo 11 um, mission that uh, when I was a student at this time, uh, uh, took as a poster and was having in my study. Actually, I was uh, still having it in my study. I still look at this, marvel at this picture. It's, I mean, that's us there. Um, we live there. And it's, it's fragile, right, isn't it? It's not stable. It's how can you... Uh, like, you must protect this. We must be much careful. I mean, this is the idea that comes from this picture. First, when I saw this picture, I was proud on having this view. I was wondering uh, how great science uh, had uh, uh, developed mankind to be able to take this look. And now it's more fragile. It's difficult to take a look. But so, okay, now we're coming up for air to do. But the air is ruined. Or do you breathe this? I mean, this is what we're breathing. So coming up for air today is a disaster. Uh, you know about the CO2 uh, contents and the, the way what we are blowing into the air. And you know that we are totally helpless. Uh, we are not doing anything about it. I mean, only on a slight uh, movement when first the European community decided that they should reduce the output of CO2. Um, and the chancellor, our chancellor was in favor of it. She got a call from the car manufacturers that this would ruin the, their production. So the chancellor took it back it, because it's more important to produce more BMWs and Mercedes than uh, have air ready for our grandchildren. So this is the air we leave for our grandchildren. Or this air we leave for our grandchildren. But in this case, we have achieved a lot. I mean, we have uh, managed to get uh, smoking uh, contained, which to me is still a miracle. 
how did we ever achieve this? Because people are obeying this, people are following it, although there are sometimes are struggles. Today, I read in the newspaper that there is a couple that is fighting against the person who lives beneath them, and he sometimes goes on his balcony and smokes a cigar, <laughs> and they want him to not smoke a cigar on his balcony, but he said it's open air. So now the judge has decided he has two hours a day where he can use this balcony. So anyhow, so we are working. But what, what amazes me most is how he ever could uh, achieve a complete, uh, um, uh, the, 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 uh, no, no, more, no more allowance to smoke in Italy. I mean, these Italians smoke, with them. And, and the reason is that the Italians love their children. And the people that are really innocent and they have get harm from smoke as children here, that's coming up for air is an important aspect we have to work on. So, and of course, coming up, the air gets warmer and warmer. We have uh, the warmest years since 1880 are listed on the left side. And you probably have read in the newspaper that 2014 is the world record. So we, last year was the warmest year on record. And this year probably will be even warmer on record. So we are really warming up. So we are, and the, you, you have seen these pictures of glaciers. There's a glacier in Switzerland, the Trift Gletscher. Three pictures, 1948 on the left, and 2002 in the middle, and 2006, and you see uh, the air is warming. So coming up for air is no longer really helpful, or it's no longer the easy solution. When we were fish, then coming up for air was a solution. Now we are human beings running a scientific uh, civilization, coming up for air, it's getting more difficult. So what do we do? So what can we do about this in the scientific community? Well, we have to first uh, make sure that people understand better what science is all about. Unfortunately, there are still books on the market and they sell unfortunately well. They say that science is at war with nature. Uh, you might not read this book because probably you are more in the hospital than in bookstores, but I'm more in bookstores than in hospitals because I'm a patient. And I read, see these books and I hate them, and they're full of them, especially written by journalists that have never done any scientific experiment or by sociologists that want to just uh, look for a new idea, new, a, new, uh, a new word uh, that is uh, being accepted in the press, and then they can be I invited to talk shows, and then they can say that we are fighting against nature. So there is something, uh, the, the good, the science has not a good public relation. And of course, there is also uh, the other difficulty, uh, we cannot, science cannot help with what I call, or what is called merchants of doubt. There's a book about it, as shows on the right side, there you see the smoke coming up in the book. And the book, Merchants of Doubt, lists um, uh, all the, scientists that obscure the truth on issues from tobacco smoking to global warming. It's amazingly how many lies in modern science are published. And they are just uh, 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 used by journalists as facts. And so, and, uh, so we have to be much more careful. And we, have to, we have to have a public that is capable of understanding what of, uh, what of which scientific studies are obscured. And there's, of course, a complicated procedure. So my idea is that uh, the only way we can really help is uh, by teaching the spirit of science and giving children an appetite for science. I've given you a few examples already what I consider the spirit of science. And I would like to warn uh, with a quote from a uh, British uh, scientist called Michael Brooks. He has published a book uh, recently, it's called The Secret Anarchy of Science, which I uh, recommend you. It's a nicely written book. Uh, it means that science can easily destroy what you consider as something that is uh, f for, uh, forever. But he points out that since the 1950s, the public face of science has been dull, spiritless, and cautious. Scientists have taken a backseat in society and culture, allowing rock stars, sportsmen, and fame-hungry TV celebrities to win the attention of our children. And you can easily see this. Um, if you just take a look, there are, I think, five talk shows on the ARD, on the first television program in Germany, a week. 
and not a single one of them has ever had a scientific topic. Even when the Nobel Prizes are given, they are not on the discussion in the talk round. They, they discuss the chairman of the Liberal Democrats, they discuss uh, uh, science is only in the talk shows if something goes wrong. But science is never in the talk shows if something works. For instance, the Rosetta success was not in the talk show. If somebody um, comes up with a new description of uh, some cosmic uh, radiation, it's not in the talk shows. If any success is not in the talk shows, they even don't know. And you can see, for instance, at the beginning of this year, two about 70-year-old persons died. One was a sociologist named... Um, Oh, I forgot his name. <laughs> uh, Beck, Ulrich Beck, thank you very much. Ulrich Beck. And he was even in the main news uh, at 8 o'clock. Ulrich Beck is dead. Who fucking cares about all that? I mean, he's, he has, he's, has written a thousand lies about his science. Oh, he's dead now. He must but of course, it, uh, a few days later, Hubert Markel died. Hubert Markel was president of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft for five years. He was president of the Max Planck Society for five years. And he has really an impact on the history, uh, on, on the development of science, on the development of society, but he wasn't even mentioned in the newspaper. So this is the difference. If somebody just yells and cries and makes uh, simple sentences that seems to be downgrading science, he is being quoted in the news, but if somebody works steadily and fast for science, he's not quoted in the news. It's science has no uh, good uh, standing in the news, in the, in, the, uh, in the newspapers and in the media. And because of this, uh, and, and this description I just gave, there's no wonder that naturally curious children show eventually lack of interest in uh, disaffection. And the other thing that you might notice, um, when you talk about sociology, or talk about philosophy, or you talk about art, or you talk about music, immediately, immediately you talk about a person. You talk about uh, philosophy, you talk about Socrates or Aristotle, or you talk about Adorno or whatever. Immediately you, you have the idea of a person. If you talk about science, no, you don't talk about person. You don't talk about an institution, about an academy, or whatever. Science, science has no face. Science is, so to speak, anonymous. And of course, if something is anonymous, the public doesn't care, and children cannot have um, make use of a good scientists that uh, that they could use as an example. So there, we have to do, we have to change the way we present science to the public. And I have a suggestion how to do this, <laughs> and with this I will conclude. And as you might expect, I've written a book about it. That's all I can do. I've written a book about it. It's called Die Verzauberung der Welt. Uh, it has not been translated into English. Verzauberung means enchantment. And um, the idea is uh, that in the general, people think that science gives answers and explains mysteries away. I don't think so at all. The topic of this book, or the idea of this book, is that science deepens mysteries. And if it deepens mysteries, it gives you the chance to get a feeling for the mysterious. And as, as far as I, am, uh, as I am concerned, this is the most beautiful feeling that you can get, the feeling for the mysterious. I give you an example of what I think why science does not explain anything but deepens the mystery. For instance, the simplest question that you can ask is why do things fall down? Now, Aristotle was wondering about this, and his idea is that things fall down because they want to fall down. That's uh, their, their natural place there. They like to rest down there. By the way, if you ask this question in the kindergarten, children, uh, they come sometimes up with marvelous ideas. Recently, some boy, uh, uh, Rosie, uh, oh, Rose's finger and said, oh, I know why things fall down, because the things that fall up are gone. <laughs> 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 that is science. So anyhow, so we still wonder why things fall down. Well, it took about 2,000 years, and eventually a fellow named Isaac Newton came along. Uh, it's difficult how he did it. He watched an apple. 
fall down, and he realized, oh, it must be gravity. Uh, so we, now we say things fall down because it's gravity. And if you are in school and the tool teacher asks, why do things fall down? And you say gravity, you get a good mark, and you go home, and you think you understand it. Unfortunately, there's a question left, namely, what is gravity? <laughs> Because the, all you have is mass, uh, the mass of the earth and the mass of the apple, or the mass of your body. And no, all you have, there's nothing but this, and all of a sudden there's a force. So how do you get the force got there? Well, here we go back to the beginning of my talk. The answer was given by a fellow named Albert Einstein 100 years ago. And here is the explanation of the general theory of relativity in one sentence. Actually, it might be two, but it's uh, something. Einstein realized that one quality of matter consists in distorting the space-time geometry. And because of that, things attract each other. Now you understand, right? <laughs> what I'm saying is, you have the beginning of mystery, namely the falling down of goddamn apples or pens or whatever. And now you explain it by saying that this is falling down because there is a distortion of space-time. Now, don't tell me that this mystery hasn't deepened. And this is, you can put, you show this in every little, uh, in, in every question. And uh, you as scientists, you know. You give an answer and you have 10 more questions. And actually, you hope you have 10 more questions. <laughs> and you hope that somebody understands these 10 more questions and finances. Uh, your effort to get 10 other questions for each question. So, but what I think is, if you teach the audience and you teach children that science is nothing that can be finished, that's only open up avenues, that science is open up on deepening the mystery, it's open up and deepening at the same time, then they get the feeling for the most important thing in the world that's the mysterious in the world. Because that's only the challenge is mystery. If you have a detective story, a mystery novel, and you know who killed the uh, person, uh, then you are no longer interested. It's only as long as the mystery you're interested. Now, of course, there is a little question left. If science is only deepening mysteries, why do we do science at all? Because, I mean, if I get only deeper into the mysteries, then I eventually get lost, do I? So. I get an answer, it is more mysterious than the question. Then I get another answer, it's even more mysterious. So where do I really would like to go? I think the answer is obvious. Because if you are really uh, uh, wondering what uh, but the, the, following the mysteries, you go deep in the mysteries. Eventually, you are hoping and expecting to achieve the mystery that, is, that you like, that the mystery that makes you satisfied, that makes, that makes you content, that feels you, makes you feel marvelous. And in this moment, you have arrived at your own person, at your own personality. But I, because I think that whenever you dig into the deeper mysteries, you are not searching for an answer to a question about nature, you are, answer, you are searching for yourself. And my, my idea is that only by digging into, deeper into the mysteries, you eventually arrive at yourself. And this is the greatest award, or the greatest reward that some thinking effort can uh, offer you. And that's why I think science is worth all the efforts that you are giving all day and that the society is giving. And that's why I think that science will live on forever. It just has to come up for air again. Thank you very much.